Chapter 6 The ordeal was not so dreadful after all. Dr. Trent was as gruff and abrupt as usual, but he did not tell her her ailment was imaginary. After he had listened to her symptoms and asked a few questions and made a quick examination, he sat for a moment looking at her quite intently. Balancy thought he looked as if he were sorry for her. She caught her breath for a moment. Was the trouble serious? Oh, it couldn't be, surely. It really hadn't bothered her much. Only, lately it had got a little worse. Dr. Trent opened his mouth, but before he could speak, the telephone at his elbow rang sharply. He picked up the receiver. Valancy, watching him, saw his face change suddenly as he listened. Lo, yes, yes, what? Yes, yes, a brief interval. My God! Dr. Trent dropped the receiver, dashed out of the room and upstairs without even a glance at Valancy. She heard him rushing madly about overhead, barking out a few remarks to somebody, presumably his housekeeper. Then he came tearing downstairs with a club bag in his hand, snatched his hat and coat from the rack, jerked open the street door and rushed down the street in the direction of the station. Valancy sat alone in the little office, feeling more absolutely foolish than she had ever felt before in her life foolish and humiliated. So this was all that had come of her heroic determination to live up to John Foster and cast fear aside. Not only was she a failure as a relative and non-existent as a sweetheart or friend, but she was not even of any importance as a patient. Dr. Trent had forgotten her very presence in his excitement over whatever message had come by the telephone. She had gained nothing by ignoring Uncle James and flying in the face of family tradition. For a moment she was afraid she was going to cry. It was also ridiculous. Then she heard Dr. Trent's housekeeper coming down the stairs. Valancy rose and went to the office door. The doctor forgot all about me, she said with a twisted smile. Well, that's too bad, said Mrs. Patterson sympathetically. But it wasn't much wonder, poor man. That was a telegram they phoned over from the port. His son had been terribly injured in an auto accident in Montreal. The doctor had just ten minutes to catch the train. I don't know what he'll do if anything happens to Ned. He's just bound up in the boy. You'll have to come again, Miss Sterling. I hope it's nothing serious. Oh, no, nothing serious, agreed Valancy. She felt a little less humiliated. It was no wonder poor Dr. Trent had forgotten her at such a moment. Nevertheless, she felt very flat and discouraged as she went down the street. Valancy went home by the shortcut of Lover's Lane. She did not go often through Lover's Lane, but it was getting near supper time and it would never do to be late. Lover's Lane wound back at the village under great elms and maples and deserved its name. It was hard to go there at any time and not find some canoodling couple or young girls in pairs, arms intertwined, earnestly talking over their secrets. Valancy didn't know which made her feel more self-conscious and uncomfortable. This evening she encountered both. She met Connie Hale and Kate Bailey in new pink organdy dresses with flowers stuck coquettishly in their glossy bare hair. Valancy had never had a pink dress or worn flowers in her hair. Then she passed a young couple she didn't know dandering along, oblivious to everything but themselves. The young man's arm was around the girl's waist quite shamelessly. Valancy had never walked with a man's arm about her. She felt that she ought to be shocked. They might leave that sort of thing for the screening twilight, at least. But she wasn't shocked. In another flash of desperate, stark honesty she owed to herself that she was merely envious. When she passed them, she felt quite sure they were laughing at her, pitying her. There's that queer little old maid, Valancy Sterling. They say she never had a bow in her whole life. Valancy fairly ran to get out of Lover's Lane. Never had she felt so utterly colorless and skinny and insignificant. Just where Lover's Lane debouched onto the street, an old car was parked. Valancy knew that car well, by sound, at least and everybody in Deerwood knew it. This was before the phrase Tin Lizzie had come into circulation, in Deerwood at least, 
but if it had been known this car was the teeniest of lizzie's though it was not a ford but an old grace lawson nothing more battered and disrep disreputable could be imagined it was barney snaith's car and barney himself was just scrambling up from under it in overalls plastered with mud valancy gave him a swift furtive look as she hurried by this was only the second time she had ever seen the notorious Barney Snaith, though she had heard enough about him in the five years that he had been living up back in Muskoka. The first time had been nearly a year ago, on the Muskoka Road. He had been crawling out from under his car then, too, and he had given her a cheerful grin as she went by, a little, whimsical grin that gave him the look of an amused gnome. He didn't look bad. She didn't believe he was bad in spite of the wild yarns that were always being told of him. Of course, he went tearing in that terrible old Grace Lawson through dear Widda hours when all decent people were in bed, often with old Roaring Abel, who made the night hideous with his howls, both of them dead drunk, my dear, and everyone knew that he was an escaped convict and a defaulting bank clerk and a murderer in hiding and an infidel and an illegitimate son of old Roaring Abel Gay and the father of Roaring Abel's illegitimate grandchild, and a counterfeiter, and a forger, and a few other awful things. But still Valancy didn't believe he was bad. Nobody with a smile like that could be bad, no matter what he had done. It was that night the prince of the Blue Castle changed from being a, of grim jaw hair with a dash of premature gray to a rakish individual with overlong tawny hair dashed with red, dark brown eyes, and ears that stuck out just enough to give him an alert look, but not enough to be called flying jibs. But he still retained something a little grim about the jaw. Barney Snaith looked even more disreputable than usual just now. It was very evident that he hadn't shaved for days, and his hands and arms, bare to the shoulders, were black with grease. But he was whistling gleefully to himself, and he seemed so happy that Valancy envied him. She envied him his light-heartedness and his irresponsibility in his mysterious little cabin up on an island in Lake Mistawis, even his rickety old gray slosen. Neither he nor his car had to be respectable and live, up to, to, and live up to traditions. When he rattled past her a few minutes later, bareheaded, leaning back in his Lizzie at a rakish angle, his longish hair blowing in the wind, a villainous-looking old black pipe in his mouth. She envied him again. Men had the best of it, no doubt about that. This outlaw was happy, whatever he was or wasn't. She, Valancy Sterling, respectable, well-behaved to the last degree, was unhappy and had always been unhappy. So there you were. Valancy was just in time for supper. The sun had clouded over, and a dismal, drizzling rain was falling again. Cousin Stickles had the neuralgia. Valancy had to do the family darning, and there was no time for magic of wings. Can't the darning wait till tomorrow? she pleaded. Tomorrow will bring its own duties, said Mrs. Frederick inex inexorably. Valancy darned all the evening and listened to Mrs. Frederick and Cousin Stickles talking the eternal, niggling gossip of the clan. As they knitted drearily at interminable black stockings, they discussed second cousin Lillian's approaching wedding in all its bearings. On the whole, they approved. Second cousin Lillian was doing well for herself. Though she hasn't hurried, said cousin Stickles, she must be twenty-five. There have not, fortunately, been many old maids in our connection, said Mrs. Frederick bitterly. Valancy flinched. She had run the darning needle into her finger. Third cousin, Aaron Gray, had been scratched by a cat and had blood poisoning in his finger. Cats are most dangerous animals, said Mrs. Frederick. I would never have a cat about the house. She glared significantly at Valancy through her terrible glasses. Once, five years ago, Valancy had asked if she might have a cat. She had never referred to it since, but Mrs. Frederick still suspected her of harboring the unlawful desire in her heart of hearts. Once Valancy sneezed. Now, in the Sterling Code, it was very bad form to sneeze in public. 
You can always repress a sneeze by pressing your finger on your upper lip, said Mrs. Frederick rebukingly. Half past nine o'clock, and so, as Mr. Pepys would say, to bed. But first Cousin Stickles' neuralgic back must be rubbed with red ferns liniment. Valancy did that. Valancy always had to do it. She hated the smell of red ferns liniment. She hated the smug, beaming, portly, bewhiskered, bespectacled picture of Dr. Redfern on the bottle. Her fingers smelled of the horrible stuff after she got into bed, in spite of all the scrubbing she gave them. Valancy's day of destiny had come and gone. She ended it as she begun it in tears.